when somebody's watching a movie, if they happen to be a videographer, they're going to see the movie differently than somebody who, say, is a writer, and both of them will probably see a movie differently than somebody who's just watching a movie because they like movies and they enjoy watching movies or they're just bored on a Sunday night and they wanted to watch a movie. Those people are going to see movies differently. In the same way as songwriters, we need to start to consume music in a different way. It's no longer something that we just do for fun. We can still do it for fun. We still should do it for fun, right? If you enjoy music, listen to music and just enjoy it. But it's also important and can be really helpful to start to listen with a more analytical ear because now when we listen to music, we're not listening to music purely as a consumer. We're now listening to music also as a creator. So we want to learn from the consumption about how to create. We care now about some of the background about how a song is made because now those are lessons that we can take and apply for ourselves. So in this series, we're going to be talking exactly about that, how to listen to songs, the, th the questions we should ask, the things we should be looking for to learn, to then integrate into our own songs, to increase our own ability as songwriters. Specifically today, we're going to be talking about lyrics, but in this series, we're going to cover a lot more than just lyrics. Starting with lyrics today, let's talk about it. Hello, friend. Welcome to another episode of the Songwriter Theory Podcast. I am your host, as always, Joseph Adala. Today, we're talking about how to listen to music analytically, how to listen to music as a songwriter so that you can learn from the music that you enjoy or music you don't enjoy as well. This is a useful tool, uh, whether you enjoy the music or not. Specifically today, we're talking about listening for lyrics. Originally, I was going to try to just keep it that generic, like all the things you should pay attention to as a songwriter listening to music. And then I realized that I probably could spend two hours just talking about lyrics, which don't worry, it's not going to be two hours. But um, when I realized that, I knew, oh, this needs to be made out into a, a mini series uh, rather than just one episode. So that's what we're doing. Also, I did mention, I believe in last week's episode that I want to talk about how to finish songs, because I think that's a huge, huge, huge struggle with people, right? I know a lot of people who can like create a beat, right? Or can, you know, create basically a jingle where like you have a, a part of a song that might be a verse or a chorus or whatever, and you like it, but you're like, now what? I don't even know what part of the song it is. I have one part of the song, but really, realistically, you need like probably an intro that might just be the beginning of the verse, and then you have a verse and you have a chorus and then a second verse. But musically, the first and second verse are usually the same outside of the arrangement. Um, and then you usually need a bridge, right? So if you have one part of a song, you're maybe a third of the way there musically. Um, and lyrically, even less, right? Because the first and second verse, or third verse even, like they're, they're all the same music, but the lyrics are usually going to change. But anyway, we will be talking about that. The reason we're not talking about that today is I didn't, I, I wasn't 100% comfortable with where I left off. And I want to make sure that that episode is, is, says what it needs to say, right? I want to make sure that all of these episodes are useful. So I would rather release it a little bit later when I feel like, okay, yes, this, this is exactly what we need to talk about, um, rather than release it on time, if you will, or release it this week and then it not be as helpful. Um, and I felt more prepared to talk about this today. So that's what we're doing in case you're wondering. For those who tuned in last week. So lyrics. First questions to talk about. Well, actually, actually, first a recommendation. This works when you're listening to songs, right? But it is more difficult to really absorb lyrics when you're just listening to them. Because the reality is the song experience is giving you a lot at once, right? There's a bunch of parts in the arrangement, usually, right? Like maybe it's an acoustic song that's just an acoustic guitar, somebody singing, and that's it. But most songs, there's a lot going on arrangement-wise, and the song's building, and, and, and then it's, you know, it adds a violin over here, and then it adds... So there's a lot of stuff to be paying attention to, right? That cool guitar riff you like, all that stuff. Not to mention the melody and the lyrics. And so it can be difficult, right? You probably know a lot of people. You might even be this person, 
who listens to a song and can listen to a song many times and even be like, I love that song and still not answer the basic question like, what's it about? Right. Or not know any of the lyrics still or just kind of know the chorus lyrics, but that's it. Um, and yet really enjoy a song. Right. So it's easy to listen to music, consuming really very or absorbing really very little of it. But specifically, lyrics can be difficult, right? Because they, they come at you, you know, kind of fast. And then there's no there's no screen, right? You can't even put subtitles on <laughs> the way that you do with a movie, right? Where like a movie, you can kind of absorb dialogue a little bit better sometimes with the subtitles. But then you realize that you're basically reading the movie. And then it's like, why don't I just listen to an audio? Anyway, not important. <laughs> but, um, but subtitles, I have I have many thoughts on subtitles, but we won't talk about that because we don't have time, but many thoughts. Um, so we don't really have that advantage when it comes to listening to music. So I highly recommend specifically for songs that you really want to target and really absorb more about, or if you're a little curious about, or you listen to it in the car and then you're like, huh, I think I missed a few lyrics there. I'm really like, this is a song I really like, like, let's figure out what it's about. I recommend just looking up the lyrics. Don't make yourself listen to the song 500 times to get the lyrics. Just put the lyrics in front of you. Read them. Uh, you can analyze the lyrics separate from the rest of the song. So little recommendation there. We'll make some of these things a lot easier. So the first question is to ask the simplest one, right? What is a song about? And I just alluded to this, but it never ceases to amaze me how many people I'll hear say, and in these people's defense, they're they're not, you know, they're not people who write music. They're just people who listen to the radio or listen to Pandora and like listening to music when they work out or something like that. But so many people will say stuff like, oh yeah, that's a great song. Um, and then you say, oh, what's it about? And they're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Which always confuses me, right? Like how, how can you possibly, how can you possibly say a song is a good song when you don't even know the most basic question of all, like what's it about? If you can't even tell me if it's like a love song a breakup song or a song about, you know, an orphan. <laughs> like, how could you possibly tell me how good of a song it is? But people do, right? And maybe you've done this too, right? Maybe you're feeling convicted right now. But the first thing you need to figure out as a songwriter, okay, what is this song about? What And what is the goal of this song? What's the theme of this song? And it's important too to go to the next level, right? So wh what I mean by go to the next level is this. There are very generic genres, right? So for example, with, with music genres, and if somebody asks you, what type of music do you like? You can say something like, um, rock, right? But when you say rock, that's such a generic, almost meaningless genre name that barely informs somebody what you like. You could be talking about seventies rock, which is very, very different than uh, let's say, um, you know, modern rock, which which even, even that, what does modern rock mean, right? According to the rock radio charts, Imagine Dragons is allegedly rock. Over my dead body is Imagine Dragons rock, okay? <laughs> like, just, just put my opinion out there. Um, like, it, it's just, just to me, like, really? Is it because it has, like, maybe real drums in it? So, oh, it's automatically rock. Like, they're pop. Sorry. Like... They're pop with like a slight rock edge. But but anyway, the point is like rock is a very generic, almost meaningless word, right? In the same way, when, when I ask you what is a song about, the right answer is not going to be like, oh, well, it's, it's a breakup song. Okay, a breakup song is a very general category, though. Let's dive a little deeper, right? So... Is it, you left me and I'm ticked? Is it, you left me and thank God? <laughs> is it, I left you and I feel pretty bad about it? Or is it, you left me 10 years ago, I still don't love it, right? I wish you didn't, but at the same time, things turned out better because of it. So I guess it's okay in the end, right? These are all completely different. Yeah, they're all generically in the heartbreak category, but somebody reflecting back on somebody from 10 years ago and saying, you know what? It ended up being okay. And and the difference between like, or, or maybe the other side, right? I'm about to break up with you tomorrow or tonight, 
Like tonight you think we're going on a date, but really I'm breaking up with you, right? There's a different type of breakup song, completely different timeline wise. And all of these things are details that are very, very important because these are the details that allow us to still talk about the things that are general human experiences, right? Like we can all say, oh, every song's about love. And I sometimes say that too. Um, and that's not true, right? But but generally speaking, it's most songs, because um, love is very important in the world, right? Like love, love is most of our like life experience revolves around some form of love, meaning like who are the people that affect your life the most? The person you choose to marry, the per the your kids who you love, your parents who you love, your family, right? Uh, you know, your friends who you love in a different way, hopefully than say your spouse, but you know, all, all that stuff, right? These are the most important people in your life that influence you the most. So of course it's, it's one of the main things we talk about. And then the other things, main things we talk about are like other life concepts, right? Um, you know, you know, for example, desiring freedom, wanting to be freed from our own, you know, depression or our own issues, right? Like what maybe we're bound by some, you know, uh, temptation that we face over and over and over again that we need to escape of the battle within. Right. Um, but, but the things like, of course we talk about some of those same concepts over and over again. They're the things that are important, right? Nobody gives a rip about like, Hey, this one time I went to McDonald's, blah, 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 blah. Like who cares, right? Like nobody cares about your McChicken. Okay. But, but somebody will resonate and care about, you know, like you dealing with, you know, feeling small or, or, or having somebody that you know who makes you constantly doubt yourself or something, right? Like those are common human experiences. Um, so what makes songs truly different though and not all the same are when you get more detailed about it. And that is where songs really separate themselves. So for example, you could write a thousand songs about love and yet none of them feel rehashed if you're talking about completely different angles of the same thing. So this is why it's important to take it to the ne next level. So main point here is really dive into, okay, what is this song about? What's the theme of the song? What's the conclusion of the song, right? What's the worldview behind this song, right? Is it taking a dark worldview on things or a light worldview on things, right? Is it, is it something where like, you broke my heart, and now I assume that love sucks and it's awful and it will always betray you, right? Like that, that's a worldview now, right? Like everything sucks. Everything's meaningless. Every lover will leave you, right? Like that's a worldview um, versus, you know, say a, a worldview, a Disney worldview, if you will, where like magically, according to the, the magical powers that be of fate, you know, you're going to you're going to magically find the one because it totally makes sense that there's exactly one person in the universe for you that just the universe magically gives you. Um, won't go any further into that, but whatever. The, the Disney worldview, right? Like, like, you know, you broke up with me, which means you're not the one and there is the one out there because that's what Disney taught me. Um, because there is no other real worldview that holds that which I say as a Christian. So if you're a Christian who believes that, you got that from Disney, just so you know. But anyway, not important. Um, so d next next question, right? So we're thinking about the worldview of, of, the, of the character in the song. We're thinking of the theme of the song, which is usually contained in the chorus. We're really talking about what is the song really about? These are important things to note. Next is... How is the story or theme of the song? Because not every song has a story. How's it developing over time? Is there a twist? Is there foreshadowing? You know, what, what's changing from one verse to the next? Because there's, this is an oversimplification, but there's basically two different types of songs in there structure of like what the verses are doing. So generally speaking, there's what you could consider a story song and what I would call like a painting song. And the difference is a story has a clear progression 
over time, right? So, for example, a song like 100 Years or uh, Fast Car or whatever, there's a clear story or Cats in the Cradle, all songs that will come back up in this episode a little bit. Um, And I think I've mentioned all those before. But, you know, 100 Years talks about the 100 years you have to live. And it walks through starting from 15 all the way to 99. So it covers like somebody's whole life in that song. Cats in the Cradle covers, you know, a, a very young son with his dad all the way through an adult son with his own kids with his dad, right? So the entire life of a father-son relationship. Um, and then Fast Car covers... I don't know. It's, it sounds like 10-ish years or something. So there's a clear timeline, right? There's this time progressing. But there are other types of songs where it's really just a painting, which if you think about a painting or a photo is a snapshot. Now, in a story, there's clear progression forward of time. In a photo, there is not. It's just a still shot. It's all the details of the photo that tell the quote-unquote story. So, for example, if I tell you, if, I'm, if I paint a picture for you of, say, okay, there's a grave, okay? There's an open grave with a casket on top. Now you know, okay, there's a, there's a funeral currently happening. And now I tell you that there is an uh, American flag on it. And there's, what is it, three soldiers with, um, I want to say musk rifles. Uh, I think it's three. Forgive me if I'm wrong about this. Um, so, so now, you know, right. Okay. Okay. This is a person who died, who served in the military. Okay. And now who are the people in the front row? It's a 16 year old girl and a 10 year old boy by themselves. So now I'm filling in more of the picture, right? Uh, before you could have assumed, well, maybe it was an 80 year old guy who had served a long time ago and, um, you know, so, 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 so the image you're getting is this is a person who, did have their time, right? You're now not assuming that they died in war or they didn't die serving, but they did serve, which is a very different picture to paint than the than the that added tragedy, right? Of like the implication of like, okay, the 16-year-old girl consoling the inconsolable 10-year-old boy with no other adult with them. Now there's this implication of, oh, did they also, did they already lose their mother? Right, Where, where's the mother? And based on the fact that it's a 16 year old girl and 10 year old boy, you would also assume that the man probably died in service because he was a lot younger, right? If you have a 16 year old kid, you're probably in your 40s or so, um, which I guess would would be decent, would be kind of old to be dying in service, but not important, right? But the point is, you're painting the picture, right? And and with the details you add to the picture, that's what fills in the quote-unquote story. But there's no progression of time here, right? This is just a snapshot. The snapshot just has enough details that you can sort of create the story. And those are generally the two ways to do this, right? So are the verses developing via, like, the first verse is one part of the story, and then the second verse is the second part of the story, and the third verse, right, is there progression of time? Like, the first verse is... I met you and you were cute. The second verse was our first date. And the third verse was we got engaged. And then there's a fourth verse at the very end that implies we get married or something, right? There's a clear time progression there. That's very different than spending two verses sort of building this, you know, image of of the chaos in my own head, right? Like with dark imagery or whatever to talk about whatever issue I'm dealing with, right? Right. That's different. There's no progression of time there. I'm just giving you different images or different ideas of the thoughts going through my head in any instant of time. So, and both of these can be highly effective, right? But it's interesting to think about these things because it's something that you can utilize in in your own songwriting, right? Am I painting a picture primarily, like a snapshot? Is there no real progression of time is there no real story, just an implied story because of all the details? Or am I specifically telling a story as if, you know, it's a, a you know, um, flash fiction, if you will. So the next question is, 
What lyric writing tools does it utilize? If you're interested in any of these in more details, I have a podcast on literally each of these individually. I believe it's like around podcast 35 through 40 or something, if you're curious. But one of them is foreshadowing, right? Songs can use foreshadowing. For example, Cats in the Cradle utilizes foreshadowing. At the end of every verse, I believe it is, uh, the, the boy says, as the father continues to not have time for him, the boy says... Still, like, still looks up to his father and says, someday I'm going to be just like him. So even though the father isn't paying attention to him, the boy is still idolizing the father, though he doesn't deserve it. Which is foreshadowing the conclusion of the story, which is now the man is older, and now he finally does have time for his son, and his son says, sorry, dad. Maybe another time, (laughs) right? Now he doesn't have time for him. The irony of... He always wanted time with his dad. He said he was going to, he wanted to be just like his dad. And that's exactly what happened. It's foreshadowing the conclusion of the story in a way that by the time it happens, even if you don't see it coming, which it's kind of a famous song. So I feel like it's one of those where like, it's like, I see dead people, right? Like I've never seen the movie that that's attached to, but I still know it because it's just profuse in culture. I feel like Cats in the Cradle is a similar thing on the music side. Like everybody knows the message of the song, but, but if you didn't, if you went into it ignorant, it probably would feel like something that as soon as it happened at the end, you'd be like, oh, it feels so inevitable now, which is what usually good foreshadowing does. It makes it so that you don't necessarily see it coming, but when it happens, it makes total sense that, that it happened that way. Or another way to see it is sometimes foreshadowing is is um, is making it so you do know what's going to happen. And it's just like adds to the tragedy watching something inevitable happen. Um, but we won't go f- much farther than that because we don't have time. I have a whole podcast on foreshadowing. Another one, symbolism. This is simple, right? We all know what symbolism is. Um, super. The, the really short version is I think symbolism can be a very, very, very effective tool to make something... Uh, a little less personalized, but also more generic so that more people can relate. So um, the beauty of symbolism is that you can utilize symbols that that to you it means something specific, but other people can take their own life experience and 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 see the symbol through the lens of their own experience and they may relate to it in a way that you never intended. But if you were specific about like, you know, I'm depressed or something, which... That's an overview. Depression is a real thing. So don't, don't, don't be that person that just says, I'm depressed lightly. I'm sad. Let's say I'm sad. Forgive me if you're somebody who struggles with depression. Um, it's a real thing. So, um, you know, I'm sad, right? <laughs> That's very, very different than like building this picture of the sadness and animosity or whatever, whatever combination of things you're feeling Because now somebody who's dealing with heartbreak and that's why they're sad can relate to it. Somebody who's sad about somebody dying can relate to it. So a bunch of people can relate to this one song via the symbols, putting their own experience on it. Whereas if you say, I'm sad because you left me and you're getting really specific about like the girl with the blonde hair who left me and I was 22 years old and I was blah, 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 blah. The more detailed you get, the, the, the more people have to you know, insert themselves into your story instead of relating, right? Because there aren't the more details you give, the fewer people are going to b- relate to it. So symbolism helps with that. I love how I said the short version. Wasn't that short. Apologies. But multiple meanings. Um, a great example of this. Well, I say a great example of this. This is the only one that I couldn't think of a actual song example of. Uh, but a song that I wrote that's an example of this is a song called Bus Stop. And basically, I learned that apparently it's a thing that at Alzheimer's centers, I don't know what they're actually called, but facilities that take care of patients with Alzheimer's, they often will have a fake bus stop because people with Alzheimer's tend to like want to go back home and want to like leave and get out, understandably. Um, So they tend to like run off and get lost because they have Alzheimer's. So they might not remember how to get back or remember who they are, or you know, all that kind of issues. So if they run off, it's a big issue, right? The bus stop though, because it's a fake one, a bus is never going to come, but they'll sit at that bus stop, which gives the pe- the people taking care of them, right? The, the people in charge of the center have time to see them at the fake bus stop, go back out, 
and then they can, you know, convince them to come back in rather than them walking into the forest and getting lost, right? So that's kind of the idea. So, but I utilize that as a, as a double meaning, if you will, multiple meanings where bus stop ends up being a literal bus stop for an Alzheimer's patient outside of an Alzheimer's facility. But it's also a double meaning of, because he keeps talking about I'm going home. So it's really him talking about being at peace with dying so that he can, he can see the people he loves again and remember them, remember their names. Cause he can't remember their names. He knows he has a home. He doesn't remember where he wants to. So it's kind of one of those things that develops over time. That bus stop is in this case is sort of an analogy for life itself. Cause this, the analogy being drawn is yes, he's at a literal fake bus stop because he's an Alzheimer's patient and the whole thing I just said, but also it is a, analogy for life itself as like life being a, a stop on, you know, before um, the next step, if you will. So um, that's an example of multiple meanings, right? One, one thing, a bus stop representing both a literal thing and a symbolic thing in that case. <coughs> um, next, open ending. Uh, an example of this is Two Lights by Five for Fighting. Basic summary of the song is is the man is going on a drive and tells his wife before leaving because his son is off fighting. And I forget exactly the story, but basically they're not sure if there's somebody was killed in a firefight and they're not sure if it was their son or somebody in their son's company or battalion or something. Um, and so he's going for a drive and he says to his wife, if he's, if he's safe, I'll know that he's all right. Just leave me two lights. So leave two lights on outside at the house because I'm going on a drive. And when I come back, I want to just be able to see the two lights and know he's okay. And the song actually ends with a very generic, you know, I'm, this isn't the exact lyric, but it's something like, you know, take a turn, seize the house, my eyes burn. So it's generic, right? Because the question is, well, are his eyes burning because he sees two lights and, you know, they're bright. So his eyes burn. Or do his eyes burn because they're filled with tears now? Because there aren't two lights, right? So we don't know, right? And for the record, the, the, what the story was based upon, the son ended up being all right. Great. And thank you for your service, person who definitely probably doesn't listen to this podcast. But anyway, um, so that's an example of an open ending, right? Or like Inception, the top. Does the top fall or not? That's what causes discussion, right? It makes it interesting. That's why people will still talk about Inception and will debate whether the top was going to fall over or not. And even the, the, the even maybe more interesting debate is, does it really even matter if the top falls? It's kind of like the Matrix, right? You could have discussed for hours, like, if, I don't know, if, if life is in the Matrix, does it even matter? Like, would it even matter? Like, at what point is it the real world? Um, but that's that's a whole other discussion. Big reveal. Big reveal is like, you know, the end of Planet of the Apes, the original movie, where he sees the Statue of Liberty and realizes, holy crap, I've been on Earth this whole time. Like, this is Earth. <laughs> um, or, you know, I see dead people, right? <laughs> like, big reveal. It's the idea that, like, you're not totally sure what's going on until the end. Or you think you know what's going on, it turns, but the rug's pulled out from under you, and it's like, oh my goodness, I've been duped. Uh, hopefully in a way that you foreshadowed so that people don't feel ripped off, but you know, there it is. And then parallelism. So fast car is an example of parallelism because fast car works as a symbol for really just freedom in general, right? Freedom from, you know, not having to work a terrible job and freedom from, I believe the, uh, I forget if the father's abusive. The father is, I think just doesn't work. Not necessarily abuse. I don't know. I don't remember exactly. But, you know, at, at first, the fast car is is a symbol of freedom from the dad with this, with this uh, boyfriend or whatever that there's all this hope in. And then eventually, later, the boyfriend turns out to be just like the dad. A little bit of parallelism. And then the further parallelism is now the fast car. Ironically, it was the boyfriend's fast car. But now... I forget if they're married or not. That detail might not be there. But, you know, it's years later. They have kids together now. Um, and then turns out the the husband or whatever is the same deadbeat as the dad was. So now the irony, right, is this the fast car is to take her away from him because he's also kind of the worst. 
Um, so that's parallelism. For parallelism, Star Wars is just a masterclass, especially specifically the original trilogy and um, the prequels. With like both both Anakin and Luke, um, you know, Luke, desert planet, Anakin, desert planet, right? <laughs> they both come from very humble beginnings. They both end up losing their hand, right? They both end up um, in in their respective episode six and re- episode three. They both face the temptation from Darth Sidious, the Dark Lord of the Sith you know, to turn to the dark side and he tempts them and even imagery wise, like he's, he's in a chair with space behind him in both of these scenes. He he tempts Anakin to kill, um, Dooku. So his apprentice. So he tempts the young person to, to the young talented Jedi to kill the current Sith apprentice and take his place. Anakin does do that. He doesn't take his place right away, but, but that is what he does. Uh, and Luke though, throws his lightsaber away, chooses to not kill his father, believes that his father still has good in him, chooses the Jedi way, and then redeems his father through that. And it's beautiful and amazing and so good. It's so good. Anyway, parallelism, right? Star Wars is a master class. Song point of view is another important thing. I have a whole, I have each point of view broken down in different podcasts. We will not spend a lot of time on this, but it's important to, to recognize, like, oh, is this direct address? Is this first person? Is it third person? How is it important to this song, right? Third person telling a story about somebody else and you not being involved in the story gives a little bit of an air of, like, an objective observer, right? Whereas direct address tends to be very emotional driven, right? You might not be a trustworthy narrator. Same with first and second person, right? The way I tell a story might not be exactly accurate, right? It's my version of the story. Um, Whereas, you know, me talking as this like omniscient observer about these two people in their story has the air of something a little more objective. Uh, And you can play with those sort of things. There's a lot more to it, but I have literally four podcasts on this. One for each first person, second person, third person, and direct address, which no is not exactly the same as second person. Um, so go check those out if you're interested. Important thing to think through song timeline. We've sort of talked about this a a little bit before with the idea of like, not all of them necessarily have a timeline, but, um, you know, so again, is the song talking about a single moment? Is the song talking about, you know, a single conversation, right? Because some breakup songs, you could say the whole song is really just telling the story of, you know, this, the one conversation, Right. It's it's you saying, why did you cheat on me? Why did you blah, blah, blah? I loved you so much. Why did you not love me back? End of song. Right. That whole thing might be the two minutes before you leave that person's house for the last time. Right. The whole song, two minutes of real world time. It also could cover 100 years. Right. (laughs) Like with the song 100 years. It also could be timeless in the sense of like. There is no sense of time. You're just talking about your ex- your experience of anxiety, right? Like you're just talking about it. But really all the things you say in that song could really be sort of uh, uh, all of your thoughts that you have in a second or any given second. You're just talking about your general life experience. It's time agnostic. Um, what type of words are used? Another question. I know I'm throwing a lot of questions at you. There's a lot here. I highly recommend just writing some of these down. But the idea, though, really, is hopefully there's at least a few of these things that you haven't thought of that you attach yourself to. And next time you listen to a song, you start to build the habit of looking for these things. Uh, I don't actually expect you to be able to do all of these things from now on every time you listen to a song. That's unreasonable. Uh, If it helps, come back and re-listen to this in a month to get a few new new things out of it. But, you know, what type of words are used, right? Is it a bunch of boring words? Probably not. If you really like the song, it's probably more evocative words. We've talked about this. Very, you know, the word hold is a little more vague than, say, grasp, right? Grasp has all these implied meanings in it, right? Grasp tends to have this, like, desperate, you know, I'm, I'm grasping somebody's garment as they're walking away, right? Like, there's, there's an implication there of a certain relationship. Hold is a more generic. I can hold this cup of water, which I need. So excuse me for a second. Tastes good. 
Um, does it though? Water. Does it even have a taste? Doesn't matter. So, um, you know, versus holding somebody you love, right? <laughs> versus like hold is just a very generic word or better example, sadness, right? Sadness is so generic. Like you could almost say all things are either in the giant category of sadness or happiness. Like saying, oh, I'm so sad is like probably the most boring, meaningless lyric ever. So sorry if that insults something you've done, but like sad is generally not the word you want to go for. There's better words like say grief, Right. Grief is much more descriptive than sad. Sad could be anything. Sad could be like, I'm sad that the ice cream truck didn't come today. Or I'm sad that the McDonald's filet of fish deals over and I didn't get one. Or, you know, or I'm sad that somebody died. Right. Like there's a massive, massive gap in sadness. Grief, though, is specifically about loss. Right. Like grief is implied to be like, I'm grieving over, you know, somebody who died or something. You don't usually grieve over the loss of a relationship, right? Like if somebody breaks up with you, grief is not usually the word you would use to describe that. Uh, whereas sadness would apply to all of these scenarios. And then last thing, rhyme scheme. And when I say last thing, for the record, there are absolutely more things to look at, right? But I'm already throwing a ton at you in this. And I recognize that. And I know that we're at a bunch you know, we're, we're late on time too. This is one of the longer episodes in a while. Um, so forgive me for that if you don't have a lot of time. Um, but there's so much more than just this. These are just a lot of really good starting places. So anyway, last thing, rhyme scheme. I've talked before about how rhyming is the most overrated thing that trips up a lot of new songwriters where they brute force rhymes and make their lyrics suffer because of it. And my argument is, look, Write a great lyric. Honestly, if it if it doesn't rhyme, most of the time people will not notice or care. If you can write a better lyric without rhyming, do it. Do I rhyme? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes I don't. I do whatever is right for the song. And sometimes rhyming gets in the way of saying exactly what you need to say. So then don't let it get in the way, right? Like, who cares about the rhyme? It's more important to say what you need to say. Um, but that being said, a lot of songs still use rhyme and I still encourage, like rhyme is a very effective tool. Uh, I don't want you to think I'm anti-rhyming cause I'm not, um, I'm just anti-rhyming at the sacrifice of good lyrics, but, uh, rhyme scheme, right? Cause, cause different rhyme schemes can, ha can give a different feeling. If you rhyme the first three lines and then the fourth rhyme doesn't rhyme, that has a very different feel than rhyming the first line in the third line and the second line in the fourth line. And there's also a different feel doing that than say rhyming line one and two and then rhyming three and four or all four lines rhyming. Like all of these are different, right? A, A, B, A, B, A, B, C, B, right? Where the second and fourth line rhyme, but the first and third don't rhyme or, you know, all four lines rhyming. Pay attention to that because that is another effective tool. Another thing to pay attention to, right? And specifically the thing I really want you to find is I'm sure there are songs that you love that don't rhyme at all, or, you know, maybe don't rhyme at all in the verses or don't rhyme at all in the chorus or something. And then you realize like, oh, I didn't even notice that. And this is one of my favorite songs. Maybe I don't need to brute force the rhyme and then end up having lyrics that rhyme light and night for the five billionth time, which again, I feel like I clarify this every time I make fun of light and night, I'm not saying don't do light and night. If it's the right thing for the song, go ahead and do it, right? Like it, it is, it's, it's solid. Is it overused? Yes, absolutely. But you know, it's fine. <laughs> I'm not saying to erase that from all your songs, just, you know, we, we want to not rely on light and night in every song. So I hope this was helpful to you. If it was, be sure to drop a like if you're on YouTube. And if you're on, on podcast and you haven't already, be sure to write a kind review if you find this stuff helpful. Again, I'm sorry that this one went a little longer. Hopefully, hopefully there was a lot of good insight in here that, that helped you. And right now you're saying out loud to me who cannot hear you, but hopefully you're saying out loud to me, dude, like... <laughs> I'm totally cool with the fact that this one was a little bit longer because you just gave me a lot to think about. Hopefully that is uh, what happened. It certainly, um, I think, was pretty chock full of stuff. Hopefully it was helpful to you. Let me know if it was. I appreciate hearing from all of you. 
thank you to all of you, by the way, who I, I've seen a bunch of reviews now. Um, really, really kind reviews. Uh, I think I've read most of them at least. Um, I, I really need to go out and read all of them because because the bits and pieces I've seen is just awesome. Uh, really kind. I appreciate that a lot. Um, and 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 just so you know, I think I've talked about this before, but just to be really transparent, like, um, you know, there's a psychological concept out there, something like you need to hear ten good things to every one to like outweigh the one negative thing, right? You know, so like. In theory, you know, you need 10 people to tell you you're good at something to outweigh that one person who tells you you suck, right? Um, oversimplified, but something like that. So um, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is if you think that when you send me an email or you just write a really basic kind comment, um, like they truly all of them make a big difference for me and motivate me to come make another episode and motivate me to keep going and give me a, a purpose, right? Because I, you do not get almost 130 episodes in um, for funsies, right? Like I enjoy talking about songwriting. I enjoy teaching songwriting, um, but I don't just do this. Like if it's not helping people, I don't want to do this, right? I would rather just keep writing songs if I'm not helping you. I would rather, so what I'm saying is if you think that you dropping a like on the video or you think that the one time that you said like, hey, nice video, just got a sub or thank you for the content or great, thanks. Or, you know, all the different comments you leave, all of those truly make a difference to me. Um, so if you ever think like, ah, he's not going to really care. No, no, I do. There's a reason that I believe I, re I respond to every single comment. I think there's one comment I didn't respond to because it just didn't, um, uh, it didn't like, I was confused and it didn't really merit a response. It just like said a thing that had nothing to do with anything. Um, but, but for everybody else, I think I've either responded or at least like hearted your comment. And that's not like, that's intentional of like, genuinely genuinely i appreciate every single one of you who chooses to do that um because it might be a small thing for you but it's a big thing for me um so just so you know to all of you out there who have ever sent me an email or a comment um as much as you might think i care or appreciate that even even if i because some of you are like wow that was a great response so that probably makes you feel like I appreciate it. Um, but as much even as after that you think I appreciate it, believe me, I appreciate it even more. Um, makes a big difference. In general, I think our world needs a lot more uh, encouraging and less um, fighting. And just not to sound like a, a peace and hope guy, but um, legitimately just, you know, some people just get on a video and want to tear it down and and you know, want to dislike things. And it's just so toxic. So all of you who like, you know, we want to do something good here and show your appreciation in any small way is truly helpful to me on a personal level. And on a personal level, I'm thankful for it, which I now know I've droned on and on about that for five minutes so <laughs> or something like that. So sorry about that. But I want to make sure that you guys know you're appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you haven't already, be sure to drop a like on this video if you're watching on YouTube. Be sure to get the lyric writing checklist at songwritertheory.com slash lyric writing checklist. If you haven't already, it is my, in my opinion, it is my the best of the three free guides I have. Um, if, so if there's one that I think you absolutely should get, it's probably that one. Um, but go grab that if you're interested. And I will talk to you next time.